We're going to be looking at a few scriptures this morning, but we're mainly going to concentrate in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 16. This is a random message. I enjoy these. Also, it's more work. Uh, but we're taking a break from the writings of Peter, and uh, probably in the fall we'll head to Second Peter. Uh, next week, uh, Father's Day, we've got some of the Peru guys that are just going to be talking about and sharing kind of in panel discussion about some of the inspiring men in the scriptures that, um, that have really challenged them when they face dilemmas and what's the big choice in front of them. And uh, <clears throat> so we're going to be dialoguing about that, and we'll try to move that fairly quickly so we can get out because we're going to do food next week. So that's the one thing you can count on. You might not get anything else. If you need a tie or two, I have plenty in my closet that I never use. So maybe I'll just bring a whole bunch, and it's like, you didn't get anything for Father's Day. Here you go. It's, it's a tie. Pastor George and I wear them usually on the same Sunday. Why? I don't know. But it's like once in a blue moon, and today is Blue Moon Day. So, um, so anyway, um, we're, 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 we're heading into, to, uh, oh, by the way, where we're heading is also, uh, we're going to do summer psalms coming up, and we're going to head into some places in psalms. You know how with summer, one of the things that you try to do a little bit, you go on a crazy vacation. Is anybody else, when family vacation time comes, uh, day one is, is day from the pit of hell, uh, usually because you're trying to get out and everything goes wrong and you forget something and whatever. That's the way it was growing up for, for me, and then... Uh, you know, by the time you get to the last day, you're just ready to get back and get home because you're tired of one another and in too tight of spaces in vehicles or where, wherever it is. And it's like, let's get black, back where we can all go to our own individual rooms and, and hang out on our cell phones or something and, and not talk to one another for a little while. <laughs> but um, relaxation, we're going to try to just get refreshed with some of the ways that you'll find that emerges in the Psalms where you have, whether it's David or Asaph or, or Solomon or different ones that uh, face challenges, but this is how they uh, built up um, their, their spiritual stamina as they called out unto God. So that's coming up a little bit later. So today is a random message, but I have a uh, very clear purpose in mind. Uh, city on a hill. By the way, the, the phrase, I, I don't know if you know the roots of it, but... Um, Anyway, it, it, it's become a, a phrase that has been grabbed by politicians. In fact, there's a number of presidents that have used it. I think Ronald Reagan in the 70s and moving into the 80s used it real powerfully to recapture uh, what he saw as uh, the establishment of America. And especially in that season of time where you had this Cold War that was going on in communism, but he called for you know, this idea of, of self-governance and the power of, of democracy and the federal system and, and how it's been set up. Um, but, by the way, with, with, with all of the challenges that are taking place and pulling us apart culturally, never, you, never lose the sense of uh, we've, had, um, we, we've had individuals and forefathers that I believe God's used in an amazing way to uh, help set up this balance, this check and balance system within our government. And the reason that they've really done that is because they had been under the tyranny of man, uh, many of the individuals. And the truth is that if uh, David was right, by the way, when there was a, when judgment from God after a census was taken that was not by the design of God. And David said, I would rather fall into the hands of God than into man's, the, the enemies. So, so don't send a foreign enemy to come and take over because you, you know, I don't trust them, but I trust you, God, for I know that you're a God of great, great mercy. And he was right on that one. Okay, I have a lot to preach. I've got 24 pages of notes, and I'm probably not going to look at them very much, but are you ready? Here we go. Um, first of all, I want you to understand that when we examine uh, biblical texts, we often do it with a very self-focused angle. So a lot of times, as we especially move toward the issue of application, we come to a big question and we say, what is the passage saying to who? Well, to me. Why? Well, we ask that question because um, we're going to be held accountable for that. So what is God saying? 
and he is, he's, he's saying it broadly, but, but what is he leading us and teaching us? And, and so there's going to be the application of how do I need to hear the word, but also then to put it into practice. But sometimes this really can take us uh, towards some inappropriate responses to the scriptures and word of God because we somehow miss the context. So I've been captured a little bit by thinking through the places in the Bible and the significance of those places. Uh, some of you have been involved in uh, some of the life groups, and you have headed through the study of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3. What do you find? You find these churches, right? And there are how many of them? Well, there are seven of them. Okay, there are seven of them. And you'll find them in places like Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum. Now, one of them you should know. It's this the city of Philadelphia. Yes, brotherly love. There's also Thyatira, Sardis, and of course Laodicea, which the message there, there is nothing positive to say about Laodicea. It's just like, guys, you better get it together really, really fast, or that, that lamp's going to be snuffed out really fast. But the truth is, when you sit down and read about every single one of these cities, um, and, and notice it's the church in these cities and communities. There's not one that's mentioned uh, Life Christian Fellowship, First Assembly of God, um, Freedom Baptist Church, or whatever names. There aren't named, but it's the believers who reside within those cities. Now, I want to just mention a couple of cities, um, but when you read in the Bible, part of the way you study through it is you think in the realm of place, because God's moving in places, we don't tend to think of God as loving places or groups of people, even though we say, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us, and we think of Jesus dying on the cross, and we think that we are there, but uh, God the Father, as well as Jesus, the express image of the Father, model for us in amazing ways the love of not just the individuals, but also of the people who reside within places. So let me express. Uh, first one has to do with Nineveh. And this is how uh, the book of Jonah closes. Uh, Nineveh is a capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And uh, most of you know at least a little bit about Jonah and the great fish. It doesn't use the word whale in it, but that's what we tell. But anyway, Jonah and that great fish. And we know that um, Jonah, like Grant, ran from God and the calling upon his life, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and there were reasons for it. And there was actually some really, really good reasons because of the wickedness of this city. But also, Jonah knew God enough to know that he was an incredibly merciful God. And if he was sending him to go with a prophetic message to that city, he was deeply concerned that God was going to redeem that city. And he did not want them redeemed. He wanted them dead. And finally, after the pity party that he has, because he's on the hillside and he's, he's, on, he's on a hill, he's overlooking the city of Nineveh. Nineveh has come into a great repentance. And God has spared them from the judgment that will fall upon them. And Jonah is sitting on the hillside and he's still longing for the, the fire of God to fall on that city. He's just like crossing his fingers. And while he's doing that and hoping maybe this isn't going to work out the way he's seeing it work out, where, yeah, they're coming into repentance and, and they're going to acknowledge who God is. And it's like, no, 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 please kill them, God. And while he's there, he builds a shelter. He's got some shade, but there's this plant that just like miraculously rises up in one day. And it's like he's getting this nice, cool, it's leafy shade. And then, the, and then a worm comes along and right at the root kills the thing, and so in the, in the heat of the day, then he loses his shade, and he's incredibly angry at God. Um, first world problems, right? And so he's arguing because, I don't know, uh, something doesn't work right. And God says to him, and this, and by the way, Jonah escalates all the way. It's not just the big fish and then gets thrown out and preached. It is. It's coming. This is the climax of the entire book. And God says to Jonah, you feel sorry about the plant. 
though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly, it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. And then there's a final question, and this is how it ends. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Jonah puts his pen down. He has nothing more to write in this, in this prophetic book. I don't have anything to say to that because God is right. God is merciful. It's a wicked city. It's bad folks. God says to Jonah, don't I have a right to have mercy on these evil people? Because he deeply cares about Nineveh and the people who dwell and reside there. Now, the second one I want to draw attention to is Jerusalem. These are the words from Luke chapter 13. We're going to look at another passage. I think it's on your handout. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you are not willing. Look, your house is left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There's one of these amazing passages of Scripture where um, I think it's in Luke chapter 9, maybe. Um, Jesus' disciples, they've got business going on, and they're in one of these villages in Samaria. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus tells, you know, go and anyway, inquire of them. And anyway, they refuse to help whatsoever because they know that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. And the Samaritans and Jewish people, they don't get along together real well. And so it's like, you're a Jewish guy, you're heading to Jerusalem, eh, there would be choice words that would be used in our generation of what they should do. But tell them just, you know, you're on your own. And um, James and John come back and they say to Jesus, <clears throat> well, do you want us? Do you, how about if we call down fire from heaven and let's just burn up the whole village? You good with that, Jesus? They really should be, we got business to do. Let's let the judgment of God fall on them. And Jesus immediately rebukes them. It's like, oh, are you crazy? What, what do you have in mind? And uh, off they go to Jerusalem. Yeah. The reason that I bring that up is it is really interesting that from this, the three J's, <clears throat> that just dawned on me. Jonah, James, and John, <clears throat> of where they're at in their heads and where they're at in their hearts compared to where God the Father is and uh, where Jesus is at when it comes to these places and these communities. It's on a very, very different page. And they see the brokenness. This is the Father and the Son. See the brokenness and the resistance, the messiness, of these cities, <clears throat> and yet they don't see them as irredeemable, unsalvageable. Okay, let's head to our passage. I told you, this is one of those random messages, and we're going, and we'll get where we need to go. <clears throat> this is in the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. Do you remember what verse 13 said? You are what? Verse 13 said, you are the salt, salt of the earth. So he's using a two um, similar images here, but word pictures. He's speaking to his disciples, but also there's a, a greater crowd that's around as well, probably overhearing. But it, it really, and he's talking about you as, as those who have entered into the kingdom of God. Blessed are you. And he's come through the Beatitudes. But then it's, you are the light of the world. You are, you are a city on a hilltop. It cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. 
Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Well, let me give you several observations, and then we're going to look at a final expression of the love of Jesus for the city of Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19 and make some application. Here's the first of several observations. There is a key shift in this passage of Scripture starting in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, as well as in 14, you are the light of the world. The shift has to do from third person to second person. And for those of you who are English people, English majors, God bless you. The rest of us are doing our best to kind of, you know, follow along. But um, <clears throat> did, you, did you have one of those English teachers that talked about writing in first person or second person or third person? And maybe you're like me, that sometimes I can go back and forth. And it has to do with I and we and they and you. And, but there is a real shift where Jesus is talking about... Uh, blessed are they, and he's talking about blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the merciful, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And then all of a sudden, there is this strong shift, and he starts looking at this circle of disciples around him, and he uses the plural, and it's not just an individual, but he just says, you. You. So, as you're listening this morning, you're probably thinking from your own personal perspective because you came other than unless, you know, you've got some children that you were forced to bring to church because you can't lock them in the closet, so they're downstairs. So but many of us, we drove into the parking, a bunch of you, I'm sorry, I took up a parking space because it was raining really, really hard, and I didn't have an umbrella in the car, okay, so... I just, yeah, bad habit, shame on me, Pastor Bob, because I was trying to save a spot for you somewhere over there, and I'm on that paper street in the gully there, but I thought maybe with the rain it'll get washed away. No, I didn't think that. But anyway, there is this key shift, and instead of us thinking as individuals, um, Jesus is looking as disciples, and it'd be like if I came here today and it's like, listen, I'm talking about not just for you as an individual, but I'm talking about all of us, you, group, Life Christian Fellowship. And here's what I'm counting on, that when you hear that, you'll understand this is talking about us as corporate body. Not just as our individual, I'm out there, I've got my life, I've got my path, I've got my decisions but it has to do with the synergy that comes from together. This is who you are. You, you are the light of the world. So do you catch that, this strong shift? And it really has to do with, with he's, he's, he's coming after them to really instruct them on, on mission and then he's going to head into the Sermon on the Mount, and I would encourage you to read it later in the day through chapter 5 and into 6 and all the way to 7 down to that final parable of wise man, foolish man, one builds his house on a rock, one builds his house on sand, and it has to do, did you listen and did you put it into practice? That's the differentiation between a life that just is, is washed away or one that stands and there's significance to it. You, Okay. Now, then there's this powerful metaphor, and we're going to focus in um, this morning just on, on the light metaphor. It's all throughout the Bible. In fact, John uses it with um, Jesus' declaration, I am the light of the world. In the beginning of, of uh, John, but also all the way into, let, let's just go all the way into the Old Testament, you'll find this powerful word picture of light. And uh, it's part of the very beginning of creation. Light is made. It's really interesting in the creation story. Light is made before the sun and the moon is ever made. Go figure. I, I don't completely get that. But anyway, God speaks it into existence. Let there be light. And um, anyway, but it's a powerful metaphor that constantly stands between light and darkness. And the idea is that God will come to illuminate your life and illuminate your path and and, and help you and lead you and guide you rather than for you to be lost in a sense of darkness. We cannot see. We do not know our way. But God is the God of all light, and he exposes what is darkness. 
And so we can count on Him and we can absolutely trust Him. And Jesus is coming and saying, you are like that. You are the light of the world. And you, you display the truth and wisdom and the way of the kingdom. And all of this is a, is a powerful impact and powerful force in the world. And we're not going to go into all the qualities of light and what it can do. There's an absurdity that comes from this text. And it's, it's, sometimes we can skip over it. But first of all, he talks about a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now catch the absurdity of this. What people who want to live in such a way that like, we really don't want to be noticed and we want to be remote and we just want to like, everybody else just leave us alone. Okay? Uh, you're not going to go ahead and to the edge of like a, a hill that's high up, and there it is, kind of the edge of, think almost like, you know, here's a, a cliff or the hill, and, and there it is, and we're going to build here. Because it doesn't matter who travels by, they're going to look and say, hey, look at that town up there. So, so what are they going to try to do? Well, let's, let's try to move in some rocks around, and maybe we'll blend in in such a way that nobody will notice. No, if you're going to do that, you're never going to put it up on the hill and in a place of prominence. And he says, so the city on the hill is going to be noticed in the same way. You live your life, and it's out there in the public, and it's for display for all to see. And then he hits the individual light, and he talks about this light on a lampstand. It's a, it's a little clay kind of thing. And anyway, it, it sits in the middle of a, in a, in a standard uh, uh, Jewish home. It would just be one room. Just one room. It's not like the kind of houses that we live in today. And it's the one room. And when you have that one room, sure enough, is, is, this, is this theatrics to go along with the, with the symbol of light? I do not know. Um, but you have, you have the one candle in the middle. And when it gets dark, and there's the candle, and it's lit. And with that, um, it's, it's going to light up the room. It's amazing when, when things are really dark what one stinking little candle will do. You've been that through power outages, right? And it's like, I just, I just have one little tea light, but we've got this thing, and it just it lights the place up more than you think. It's pretty cool. All right, so we've lost the PowerPoint. Okay, we got a new computer that's coming, but don't blame Katie. It's not her fault, all right? Now, after we get past this absurdity, oh, and the absurdity of the candle in the room. So why are you going to light the candle in the room and then put a basket over the top of it? And everybody would go, well, of course you wouldn't do that. That's a stupid thing to do. And then it goes on from there. And Jesus explains, this is how you shine for all the world to see. And he uses two words, good Deeds. Good deeds. In other words, you are going to live your life in such a way that the kingdom of God that's within you is going to be manifest and displayed from your life. And that's why it's important that you read the rest of chapter 5 and 6 and 7. Because Jesus talks about the way that we, we do religious acts that it's not about us like the Pharisees, and that it's like we really love people. We don't use them. That's why lust is so wrong, because we'll use them for our fantasies or just use them for their physical bodies. That is wrong. And he talks about the, it, it, it's not just the violence on the external, but it's also this this hatred on the inside of you that shows up in so many different ways, it just doesn't belong in the life of somebody who is following the Father in the kingdom of God. Make sense? This has to do with these good deeds and these outward things, even to the point where Jesus says, so people aren't going to be nice to you. 
And when they're not nice to you and they slap you upside the head with, with, with the insult, you turn the other cheek so they can backhand you, which is even a greater insult. But this is how you do. And in this, um, it's actually good deed for the purpose of giving glory to God. Where even our enemies, we love them. We demonstrate it. It's, it's good deeds. Jesus uses a simple phrase where he says, even if you give a cup of cold water, in the name of the Lord, you will not be without your reward. He tells a powerful story about a Samaritan, the bad guy. He's the villain of the story. He should be. But he's the one when the religious people pass by the guy in need. The Samaritan comes along and he sees him. And first of all, he's not afraid to violate his, um, uh, anyway, where he will be unclean and therefore disqualified from the religious duties that the priest and the Levite would have. And instead he comes and he just starts nursing the guy back to health. That's what he does. Jesus champions these causes. You are the light of the world, and you live as the light of the world so that people can see what will they see? They will see good deeds. And there's also another observation that it's all will see good deeds. There's this sense of inclusivity. Good deeds. For all to see is the heart of the Father. So here are Jewish people. And they are, are in fact, in the Old Testament, it speaks of Israel and Jerusalem, Jerusalem especially as like that city on a hill to be the light of the world. And yet, they lived in this exclusivity and they thought it was all about them. And it was very difficult, even the early New Testament church, to open up toward the outsiders and the Gentiles. But this is the heart of what Jesus is getting at. This light is for all. For all men walk in darkness. All men need light. So we live out our lives as light, that the goodness, the character, and the nature of the very kingdom of God would exude from our lives so that they can see it and its good deeds for all to see, not just inside the walls of the church, but outside. And the final thing is motivation. There's a fill in the blank if you're doing the message notes, which you really should do. By the way, next week... Get on it. Motivation. Now, Jesus is, is, is going to warn. It's coming up in the Sermon on the Mount. And he just says, listen, be really careful. Because a bunch of these religious folks, this is what they do. They do their good deeds, their display of righteousness, and they do it for themselves to establish a reputation so that everybody will think, you are really spiritual. So in other words, they're, they're looking at their, their life, their act, their spirituality, and if nobody else is looking, it's like, then what's the point? And so they say their prayers publicly, and these normal times that you will find in, in the, this was the hour of prayer, and they would either, either go to the place of prayer at the temple, or some of them would go ahead and uh, they're out in the marketplace, but they would stop at that hour of prayer. And there they would stop and they would raise their hands to God and they would call unto God. And everybody in the marketplace would go, oh, look how devoted they are and how spiritual they are. And Jesus says, you got your recognition. Everybody paid attention to you, but that's it. There's absolutely it. There is no reward from the Heavenly Father, but then he talks about the prayer that takes place in the closet. In other words, you find your still, quiet place, and it's in that place you call unto your Father. And the God who hears you when nobody else does is the one that will reward you openly. I don't want to do an evaluation of how we're doing in our prayer closet. As Americans, we are not given toward that. We almost see it as pointless. But Jesus says it's very, very powerful. And by the way, this has to do with motivation. 
Jesus says, you are the light of the world, therefore, and talks about good deeds for all to see, but the motivation is for the glory of God. It's that attention might be drawn to the, to the, to the king, the very one who is the king over all. And we are merely his subjects, but we serve the king, and as a result, that others might see, and as they see, they would run to the God of blessing and give glory to God. Now, I want to just take you to a final appeal that echoes from the life of Jesus. And this one is later on, it is another approach toward Jerusalem. And this is the final approach. It's in, within these last days of his life, the final Passion Week. And when you read in Luke 19, we're going to start reading, I'm going to start reading from you, uh, to you from verse 41. But here's what you will find. As you read this, you will find the passage of Scripture that it talks here about the triumphal entry. I better make sure on this. I don't want to wade through any more of my notes. Luke chapter 19. Do any of you have a heading in your Bible, whether it's on your phone or do you have there? Oh, yeah, there it is. Do you see it? Triumphal entry. You know what that is, right? Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So all this is taking place. And it has been a grand celebration. The crowd has broken out in praise it's a magnificent day. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's very messianic. He's coming to save us. Verse 41 says, But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way of peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side, and they will crush you into the ground and your children with you. And your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Now, there's two times in the Bible where you find that Jesus wept. Do you remember the first one? John chapter 11. Mary, Martha, Lazarus has died. Verse 35, shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. The word that's used for weeping there has, is the kind of weeping where your eyes, you know, you're moved emotionally. And... Um, your eyes well up with tears, and there's tears that are begin to just drip down your, your cheeks. That's the word that's used there, where Lazarus is dead. Mary and Martha are, are in deep sorrow and disappointment. And Jesus is moved at the entire scenario. He is the resurrection and the life, and uh, it's, he's broken humanity, and they still don't understand the repercussions of that. But he speaks it forth. And Jesus wept. The weeping here over Jerusalem is very different. The weeping here and the word that's used for it has to do with a strong, almost violent outbreak of tears. Have you ever cried like that before? Jesus sobs out and lets out a mourning wail as he sees Jerusalem. He is deeply moved. And why is he so deeply moved here? Well, some of the words that Jesus uses are very strong and powerful words. First of all, it, this does demonstrate and show him as the Son of God. It shows him as the one who is able to see into the future, and he understands what's going to happen to this city. So as he bursts out into tears, it's right around 30 A.D., there's a few short days. He will be crucified, but then will be resurrected from the dead. He will ascend into heaven. But about 40 years down the road in 70 A.D., the time will come. 
And because they have rejected him and they rejected the work of God, um, there will be a rebellion that rises up there in the city of Jerusalem and Rome will come to put its foot down upon this great city. The Roman armies will come. 70 AD, they did it. It was terrible judgment upon them. And what you will find is um, Roman soldiers come, thousands and upon thousands of them, and they encircled the city of Jerusalem. It's what Jerusalem, the Jewish people called the Great Siege. And as they surrounded the city, what they did was they just surrounded the city and cut off everything from coming in and out of the city. The rebellion will be done, but it will be a slow, long, agonizing demise of everyone who lives inside of this city. It was one of the most terrible, most terrible events in Israel's history. Ultimately, as the city is starving, you will find women who killed, ate their own husbands and children. Out of sheer, they're starving to death. They stole food out of one another's mouths as they fought over something to sustain them. That kind of desperation. And the Roman soldiers waited year after year until they knew that the people were completely famished and devastated. And then they rushed in and they slaughtered them by the thousands. And anyone who survived the horrible ordeal were taken violently from the city of Jerusalem and marched to the city of Rome where they were slaves to the force of Rome. They were involved in building the Colosseum and many other places as their slaves. And Jesus sees this. And he bursts out weeping, for he understands the deep sorrow and the temple that's been built and the splendor of the city and where he's been on the streets, and he understands what they will go through. So it's prophetic. It's inspired by truth and foreknowledge that comes from God. And by the way, if you have any questions about it, read about it from, uh, from Josephus. His famous book entitled The Wars of the Jews or The Jewish, uh, or Jewish War. And you will find it, and it is just part of Israel's history, a horrible situation. Jesus sees that. Okay, coming after you. No, not you as an individual. I'm coming back for you as a church and a people. You are the light of the world. And we live in a community. When Jesus drives down Springfield Road and he crosses into Springfield. This is where we are, by the way. Not all of you live in Springfield. I do not live in Springfield. But this is our community. <clears throat> when Jesus approaches it, what do you think Jesus sees? What does he hear? What does he know that we do not know? And he knows it all. But one of the things is this. I believe Jesus is bothered by religious people that just want to call fire down from heaven because of the, some of the dissenting viewpoints that are taking place in our world today. And I'm concerned about it too. We got some real cultural battles and wars that are taking place. For those of you who are parents of children, you have every right to be concerned, but you don't have a right to be fearful. There's a God that's ahead of you in this. And he has the deepest compassion for you, for our children. And he's got plans for them. And he will redeem and he will restore and he will help. For he would look at all of us together and he would say, oh, don't miss it. Don't be fearful. Don't go hide, for you are the light of the world. Don't hunker down. You are the light of the world. We have a community that really needs us. So if you head to the website, and there you will find Springfield Township. 
home of to over 24,000 residents, our vibrant communicated is lo located in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, only 12 mi miles from uh, southwest Philadelphia. We're conveniently located near Philadelphia and Chester and Montgomery County. Since 1924, the township of Springfield have been, has been governed under the provisions of First Class Township Code. And it traces its governmental beginning to June 21st, 1686, when the early settlers from Europe secured land grants from William Penn. Our community is full of thriving shops and restaurants and bars and a country club with a municipal golf course, swimming pool, clubhouse, churches of various denominations. See, they're talking about us. <laughs> An excellent public library, indoor ice skating rink, and so much more. Our extensive park system of 211 acres in 24 locations offers playing fields that provide... There's a whole lot of parks! In Springfield, look down at the list. They provide athletic and recreational relaxation, which are utilized by various athletic organizations and residents. You'll find all kinds of things, even the zoning codes that are there online. We are a church that has been planted in this township. And Jesus calls for us to have um, this deep sense of we have been planted here to come together to be light to our community. And one of the values that we are wrestling with with the Acts 2 Journey team has everything to do to, with this. What does community mean to us? On the township map, you look it up. Right where our property is, you got Old State Road, and it has it coming all the way through to Springfield Road. You know what Old State Road is? It's that paper street, yes. Who whispered it? It's that paper street, yeah. That's what that is, Old State Road. And right here, there's a little flag where we're at. And it's a school. <laughs> so in other words, the township map's a little bit old. We're not, there's a school that beats here, but we are a church. And God has planned us here to be great light. So we're going to pause. Why don't, why don't the worship team come on back, would you? And we'll probably sing at the close. I guess they'll lead us. But uh, Jeff Rudolph, who is the president of our township commissioners, and he is our ward commissioner. Lives right back there, just over your left shoulder, right back there. And Jeff, as well as uh, Chief Daly, sat down with Springfield Ministerium a couple of months ago. And uh, as ministers and pastors in the ministerium, we just asked the question of so there are some things that we do traditionally to kind of help with needs, and most of the needs that we give toward has everything to do with kind of around our community, but not always in our community. And one thing we're involved in is, is Super Bowl of Caring, which is community and churches coming together. But other than that, you look at many of the compassion needs, and you sit back and say, so what compassion needs do we do, we, do, we do in Springfield? How many of you live in Springfield? Can you just raise your hand? Oh, there's quite a few of you. We have more people that live in Springfield as the percentage of our church than, it, than in the previous 28 years. So we have more people from our community that's coming and living here and coming and attending church. <clears throat> but one of the things that emerged of needs, there's this huge, there's the issue of, of the whole op opioid, and that's not going away, and that hits every single community. But I heard... Uh, Mr. Rudolph uh, expressed, and they talked about the need to rebuild a sense of community in our community. And that was the one thing that I really heard from him. And um, 
So I communicated with Jeff and, and just said, Jeff, I, I know you have a heart because of the COVID and everybody locked down and, and some of the traditional things from our community that they do to just instill this sense of community. Springfield's an interesting town, isn't it? We're in a metropolitan area and sometimes, I remember times we'd sit on the edge of a, you know, Saxer Avenue with one of the parades with the kids and it just felt like Mayberry. Yeah, just, just hometown, just hometown. But uh, Jeff expressed, we just really feel a need. We've just been so divided, and we have felt this heavy weight on so many individuals, and we're anxious and we're hoping that this summer can be breakouts. Do you have your hand out? Do you have information there? I need one of those. Eliezer, you got one for me? Sit on the back table. Run, man. Yeah, yes. Open that up, would you? Um, you're going to see this, and it's on the inside. And where is it? Bump, 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 bump. Right under Dad's Day, Grow a Beard Day. Right underneath that. It just says some summer community events, and these are some that are coming up here in June. Do you know that this Wednesday... There's dining on Saxer Avenue. And uh, you can go there. You can invite a friend. You can, just, you can just go there. Have any of you gone to the dining on Saxer before? You have. Awesome. And then there's the Catholic Community Choir on the 22nd, and that's over in there's an amphitheater next to the township building. But do you see the 29th? There's a movie night for families, for kids. I'm not even going to be here because I'm going to be in Peru. But one of the things that I said with Jeff is, uh, Mr. Rudolph, if you'll send me the information, I'll, I'll get that to our congregation and I'll get that to other pastors in our community. And if there's one place that I think the Church of Springfield could just in a simple way be a light, would be to help rebuild in some way a sense of community here for people who have felt isolated. So I said, Jeff, I don't know what you guys do on the movie nights because I haven't come. But I think I might be able to inspire some people to bring some bug spray because the bugs are going to be out there at night in the amphitheater. And maybe we could bring a grill and have some hot dogs and, and just some stuff there just to hospitality and love and care about people. No strings attached. Sometimes it's hard to find what does a Jesus thing look like in our community. But that's one simple way that I think in a real simple way on there's three or four movie nights in our community. If we would just show up with some teams of people and just be present beyond the walls of the church in our city and in our community. And I'm asking for your help, plural, to help make that happen. Bow your hearts, let's pray. Lord, it's hard for us sometimes to know exactly how to especially do good deeds corporately in a community that seems to have everything. But we know, Lord, that our community is filled with some of the same brokenness that you will find amongst the rich as well as the poor. You'll find addictions and you'll find depression and the sense of isolation and brokenness and hurting. And we're just asking of you, Lord, that you will help us to open our eyes and really see 
Jesus, there's not one place that in the Bible that it records that you wept for yourself, not even with all the brutality that, that took place on the way to the cross and upon the cross. But Jesus, you wept with compassion over those who mourned and you wailed with compassion because of the brokenness and the rebellion and the trouble that would be ahead. And Jesus, in those tears, it says strong words to us that we need to be deeply moved and concerned for our community, God, because it's not just the economic needs of our community, God, it's the spiritual needs of our community. And we ask of you, O oh God, that you will forge something inside of us to be a church that isn't bound up inside of our walls, but to be a church that's really like you say we are, a city on a hill, a light in the middle of the room, and that you will give us not arrogance or haughtiness, but you'll give us this humble, gentle spirituality that is healing God to our community, that is helpful to our community, and that honors you, O oh God. So teach us to be a church that just washes the feet of weary ones who are around us. Give us that grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. to be for creation. Let's dance, praise God.